Welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is the Questionable Garage. And next to me is my Toyota Supra, my brand new Mark V. No, it's, it's not that yet. This is the second episode in our series of where I'm trying to take some of my knowledge and teach you guys how to find good flip cars, something that's broken that you can buy for a good price, fix up, and then sell for profit. And my goal is to slowly work my way up to a brand new 2023 See You Later Gray six-speed turbo Supra. I love that color. There's only 500 of them. So I'm gonna have to do a lot of flipping. So this right next to me is a 1998 Toyota 4Runner that we found on Facebook Marketplace as broken and I got it for $1,200. We're trying to work within a $2,000 budget to buy, fix, and make this the best possible thing that we can to sell, to make the most money possible. And along the way, if you're trying to do this at home, you're gonna pick up some really good skills on how to troubleshoot and fix things. It's just a really cool process of finding something inexpensive, slowly fixing it, making it better, because you learn the whole way along. Now, in the last episode, it was just a real kind of brief wrenching episode. We went through the rules in really big detail. The uh, five questionable garage, questionable car buying tips. The tips aren't questionable, the cars are the questionable part. But we went through them and I kind of relayed that into this car and why we went with a Toyota. I worked in a Toyota dealership for five years and as a Toyota master diagnostic tech. The process of problem that this car had was it broke a timing belt, they put a new belt on and it wouldn't start again. Now, this has a Toyota 3.4 liter V6. It's a non-interference engine, so the likelihood of major engine damage was really small. So that's where we took the gamble. We got it, we put it all together. We spent our first money, $76 on a battery. We connected it and the lights flashed, which told me this had a factory aftermarket, like a port installed security system, that if you don't lock and unlock the doors, it won't start. So we locked and unlocked the doors and it fired right up. Runs good and we drove it around the parking lot here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's your traditional 3-4. But it's not that simple. There's some cosmetic issues. There's still a few more mechanical things it needs to maximize potential profit. So in this episode, we're gonna go ahead and inspect the entire truck front to back. We're gonna look at everything mechanical we can find wrong and everything cosmetic that we can find wrong. And then I'm gonna go through the process of prioritizing it. We're not trying to make it perfect. If we were making it perfect, there'd be no money to be made. Just being honest, like it's gonna take a lot of work, but someone doesn't need a perfect vehicle for it to be a good used vehicle for them to buy and use. A good looking vehicle will always sell better than a bad looking vehicle that runs great. So we're gonna have to do some balance of the mechanical repairs and then try to see how far down the rabbit hole we wanna go. We're gonna walk around and uh, we're gonna start a notebook, um, maybe I should get two, of all of the things that I just kind of find wrong with this truck, and we're gonna make it cosmetic, and we're gonna make it operational, then we're going to try to price out parts and rough time, and then we're gonna come up with a priority list, and I'm just, I wanna take you along for this entire process, because one of the greatest things about the YouTube platform is I'm able to share some of my knowledge and experience with you guys. And as much fun as putting a big block is in a 300ZX, no one else is gonna do that, but you're gonna go online, you're gonna find a car that you like and wanna fix for yourself, or you wanna try to fix and flip some of these cars for profit. Let's uh, go handheld and introduce you, that's a good sound, to this beauty of a 4Runner. What we're looking for will actually serve also as a good thing just in a general pre-purchase inspection. If you're looking at buying a car, even if it's not a project, just what we're looking at is what you're gonna look at trying to pick out a car. We're not gonna be nice. The hood and this whole corner, we've got a little bit of squish. Cosmetically, something hit here, and all this is pushed in a little bit. The headlight's broken, the hood is dented, bumper, fender. This whole corner of parts we're gonna potentially need if we're going to chase a perfect vehicle. Coming along, I'm tripping, we got some fender damage. Our antenna mast here. That's, that's not supposed to do that. That's broken. Our windshield is broken. Wiper blades are shot. Probably the worst cosmetic is this uh, repair here, this 
Bondo work and uh, metal work, not the best. We're not doing good on our paint. We are missing the caps for the roof rack. When you're walking around, you're just taking a visual, just overview of everything. Obviously there's little dents and scratches. It's got a little bit of a squat. If we took the little spacers out, it would sit a lot better, be a little bit more on the level. We have a damaged rear bumper, rear wiper, is uh, also kind of crunchy and shot, little little scrapes. Cosmetically, she's a bit of a pig, but that's okay. This door is banged up a whole lot. I don't know if they parked another vehicle next to it and the kids just weren't nice to the car or, or what. That's banged up and there's no clear coat left on this fender. That's the exterior cosmetic walk around. Let's take a peek on the inside. We are blessed with a fairly Decent interior. It's in pretty good shape. I just, I don't want to know what's under here. I'm imagining they look like they're brand new and we're just going to include the seat covers with sale. Our steering wheel is a little bit worn here. We have got a worn armrest. We do not have floor mats, but that is okay. We can get some floor mats. We've got all of those other parts we'll remove. One thing I also noticed on both rear seats is the uh, window switch surround that little black plastic right there let's zoom in that guy on both sides is broken now that's not an entire switch that's just a plastic surround so that's something small we can do to really improve the interior and then up here the plastic is in really good condition a lot of times that fake wood grain breaks but if we notice we got ourselves an aftermarket radio and uh Cue me grabbing the key real quick and coming back so we can try to turn that on. I did not just wander around the shop looking for him, forgetting I put him in my pocket. That's seven minutes, I'll never get back. Key in. Oh yeah, here, let me turn the AC. AC works great. Oh, starter contacts. That'll be a fun thing to show you guys in the next repair video. Doing Toyota starter contacts. A lot of times people will want to replace the starter when you actually just need to replace $7 worth of parts. Come on, click. There we go. If you're a Toyota person, you know that noise very well. So we have a Pioneer head unit here and it should have turned on. Uh, source. All right, is it not fully seated sometimes with these detachable face plates? We have an aftermarket radio that doesn't work, so we'll need to diagnose that. Odds are it's just stuff in the power feed, so we can get that brought back to life, hopefully without too much trouble. That's a long list of cosmetics, and it's a very expensive list of cosmetics, so that's where we're going to price things out and decide what matters most and what isn't a lot of uh, money and what's really crucial, like a windshield. Windshields are very important, but unfortunately, they're not cheap. So I already got a call into my glass guy. We'll see when I get that price back. But uh, uh, all right, let's pop the hood, take a look under there. If you watched the first episode, we got this thing initially, all of that apart and all it took was putting it together and it runs amazing. Now it actually is not leaking oil, but I do want to replace the valve cover gaskets into intake manifold gaskets. It's like a little bit wet around the back where there's some silicone plugs. If you're at all familiar with this 3.4 liter, they have little just machining plugs that get pushed in front and back from when they're doing the line bore of the cam journals and the silicone gets hard and it starts leaking. Also, there's supposed to be little rubber washer um, under the bolts that keep tension on the valve covers and these are completely shot. This was a part and I just put it back together because we didn't know if this engine worked. I did not want to put any money into it until we knew we had a good engine. So we're gonna need an intake manifold gasket set and a valve cover set, including washers, and then a little bit of silicone. We're gonna need a battery tie down. It's missing the base, this little thing does nothing, and that does nothing. We do not want the battery flying around in the engine bay, so battery tray. Now these are mechanical things. We're down to what's gonna make it work well. Now this is gonna seem almost like it's cosmetic, but it is a mechanical thing. This brake fluid reservoir is starting to fracture. You see lots of small cracks in it and the fluid's gone dark. So yes, it's functional, but if we're wanting to do it right, we put a new one in. Plus visually, brand new nice fresh part in the engine bay when it's cleaned up 
is gonna look really good. We need this air intake boot. The electrical tape is not a long-term solution, so we need this boot. On the top side, everything is good because the gentleman who had it had already done brand new coils, brand new wires, brand new spark plugs, has a brand new radiator in it, an entire new timing set with tensioner, water pump, everything behind the cover is brand new. Up here, we're looking really good, but there's like a whole other side of the truck. We gotta get underneath it. Um, now, one thing I did do in the last episode, which we're not gonna do just for the sake of getting through this inspection, is we drove it and it drove well, it shifted through all of its gears and it stopped. So that's working for us, but let me go ahead and uh, get this thing racked up. And I've, I've not seen under this truck. I have no clue what it looks like under there. So we will, we will discover this together. Let's get a look underneath our Forerunner here. So we did know that the front skid pads are removed. Now, if you're getting a two wheel drive or four wheel drive, they still have the same front skid pads. And really for the most part, the front suspension, you just don't have the differential and uh, axle shafts. So looking in here, our front brakes, it's kind of hard to see from this angle, but they're halfway worn or so. They're not, uh, not totally shot but it's enough that we may go ahead and put pads on it because you can get pads pretty affordable for these trucks. Now, coming to leaks, we have just a little moisture, nothing absolutely gushing. Um, it looks bad, but something you run into with an automatic transmission that sits a really long time not running is your torque converter can drain back. And if it drains out, that puts a whole lot more fluid in the pan that you normally wouldn't have there and when you do that, it tends to weep a little bit. So right now, fluid levels a smidge low, but looking at the moisture, it doesn't really dictate that it's pouring out fluid anywhere. It's just most likely from sitting a long time and then suddenly kind of getting thrown back into life. Now this oil pan has been off because there's a little bit of orange silicone. Also, that's not a normal patch, but it is the right kind of rubber. There's been a little, you know, a little custom exhaust work there. We got things reconnected. Um, again, nothing amazing, you know, nothing terrible. We've got just traditional Forerunner stuff. We've got a little bit of a torn boot on the rack, but I don't feel like any, any bad feeling there. Our suspension parts are tight. What you want to do is kind of grab and pull and just make sure there's no looseness in any of it. And that is all nice and tight. And kind of coming back and looking where our damage was here, I don't see anything in the frame rail. You can see on the body mount, it's the body is just tweaked ever so slightly. So all of that's looking really good. One of the most egregious things under here is all this pink paint on the suspension. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why they felt the need to spray suspension parts pink with plastic dip, but they did it. Looking underneath here, you just wanna to look to see any crazy bent parts, things that don't look right, something out of the ordinary. Again, that wiring I was talking about right here on the alternator, that just needs to get properly soldered. Look at your bushings, they're a little bit weathered, but not really demanding any attention. It's just wet, that needs a good cleanup come back check our drive shaft and we actually look you can see what looks like a fairly fresh u-joint why do we got some plays that u-joint well i said it looks like a fresh u-joint but we need some u-joints in this drive shaft probably could use a trans oh yeah that's a tear in the transmission mount so we need a transmission mount and u-joints that's definitely going to have a big effect on how the car drives these drive shafts when they start to go they vibrate bad um that's not a lift point that might be why our fuel gauge isn't super happy is it's uh 
been crushed a little bit. Probably should look for a gas tank. Looking along here, we've got some more of that pink plastic dip. I guess it's got my name on it, you know? We can see where that bodywork was, or I don't know if I'd call it bodywork. Bondo work. This, this is nice and straight, so this could have been pulled out a lot better. So we have to decide, is it worth going through, knocking all this Bondo and doing body work and getting it a lot closer? Because I believe we can. U joints in this drive shaft. Yeah, they've been done once before, but for some reason they're already shaking and this isn't good. So during my test drive, I noticed a really, really grabby rear brake. That's, that's axle grease. So these rear ends are notorious for having axle seals that go bad. We're looking like we need rear brakes and an axle seal. So that's, you know, that's not terrible. I mean, I could have found a bent frame or a rusted frame or something real bad, but we got rear wheel seals. We've got a drive shaft that needs some attention and some cleanup work. We got to figure out uh, our price list then. So again, just look over everything, see what looks out of place, what looks worn, what looks like it shouldn't be there. And uh, it gives you just a good idea overall on the vehicle, especially with these uh, 90s Toyotas, you really need to look at the frames pretty good. Let me finish writing up the list and then we'll uh, get started on trying to show you how you go through the pricing process. <sighs> finished writing everything out I'm beginning to think even though it sells a truck better we'll just ig ig ignore that <sighs> we're gonna be okay it's just <sighs> Well, it is the next morning and I'll be honest with you guys I was planning on making the wrench episode its own thing but I changed my mind. We are just going to have kind of another mini mega episode, how to find everything wrong with your flip car or project car. And then we're just gonna fix it and get it ready to sell. So this is gonna be a two part series and then we're ready to uh, try to find our next car. I was doing some prep work, just kind of walking around the car, coming up with a game plan, getting ready to set up cameras. And if you notice, we're a little bit further apart here. Um, I missed something in my tests. Uh, suspension was tight and for some reason I just didn't feel the wheel bearing but you can hear the wheel bearing listen to that that is crunchy I can grab the hub and actually this is really bad so we're gonna end up probably over budget I need to price out a wheel bearing so when you're doing this you have a couple options one I may call up Pulsies where I just was at and got a fuel tank and a tail light and see how much just this knuckle assembly would be if they've got one with a good bearing. Usually they're not terribly expensive and it may let us get the part we need and a new wheel bearing newer than what we've got for a reasonable price. Now, sometimes you just wanna change a bearing out, but in my experience, a lot of times, especially when it's this bad, so much heat has been transferred into this hub that even if we got the new bearing, took it all apart, new seals, new bearing, this hub has had so much heat, it's mildly deformed, you'll get it together and that bearing will fail soon after. Now we're selling this car. Soon after doesn't necessarily really matter, right? Wrong, we have integrity. We don't wanna pass the buck. We don't wanna send a potential big problem to the next person. So we're gonna potentially need a hub as well and that's gonna get way more and way out of budget. So again, this is just where you have to start making the decisions. A bearing, probably $40. A hub, I think they're usually like 160. I haven't even looked up prices. I may be able to get a knuckle assembly for 50 or $60. So we gotta make a phone call either way. We gotta take it off. I'm gonna go ahead and get camera set up because we are working on taking out our squatty spacers. Um, and in order to do that, because it's just a little bit too long, we're actually having to kind of drop and pull the knuckle anyway. So we will uh, quit talking and get working, right?
Well, that was something. If you saw on the time lapse, um, I knew the fuel gauge probably wasn't accurate. I just didn't expect it to be a full tank or a three quarter full tank. And as I was lowering it out, it dropped. And you have to make those decisions. There's no reason for me to try to save it. I'm replacing it. If I tried to catch it, it's very heavy. I would have hurt myself. It was just get clear, let it hit the ground. If you guys are ever under your own cars working and something starts to slip, nothing on your car is worth you getting hurt. So just be smart. Know if you just need to let go and just shove and get clear and let it hit the ground so you don't get hurt. That surprised me, but I just went ahead, moved the cameras and just kind of cleared my head. We got ourselves a new fuel tank in there. We've got lines. I replaced missing bolts and I found out why the bolts were missing. While the gentleman was trying to figure out why it wouldn't run, they put a fuel pump in it. While they were doing the fuel pump, they broke the arm off the sending unit. So that is why it didn't work. In my experience, I would rather use an OEM pump that's old than some of these brand new and expensive parts. That's, I couldn't find any reference numbers on that pump assembly, meaning it's likely pretty much the cheapest of the cheap, not good compared to what is most likely a Denso pump that I know was gonna be good for a nice, long time so tank is in i do have this axle shaft out and it smells awful and what's funny well i don't know if it's funny or not is the seals were actually put in the right spot those retainers but if you look it's kind of hard to see how much that seal is tilted inwards when they drove it in they didn't drive on the outside like you're supposed to they pushed on the middle and warped that seal really bad its diameter actually changes just enough that it doesn't seal. We will get that seal in, we will replace that bearing. Now you may say, hey, it's not making noise. Can you just clean it? Technically, yes. But what you run into is that gear oil has washed all of the bearing grease out of your sealed bearing unit there. That is a dry area. It's not meant to get gear oil and it's not actively lubricated. So if you don't, you will have a wheel bearing failure. Do it right, get it all apart. Um, we'll have to get that drum turned and cleaned up. But yeah, what else have we done? Oh, that's pretty much it for now. We've got it almost all tore apart. We need to get drive shaft out. And then of course the valve cover stuff on top. We're making good headway on the mechanicals. Um, I can keep talking or I'll just go ahead and get back to rent. Well, no, I need to call and try to find that knuckle. Then we're going to get back to wrenching. Well, all right, we are in the cab because we're, you know, waiting on a bunch of parts and I have a new antenna mast but that can't get installed if the radio doesn't work. So we went ahead and got a little time lapse. Hopefully you can see. We pulled the radio. One, we found the radio's fuse blown. And that's because at some point it had an amp and they just kind of pulled it quickly. Also, that that's not right. Don't just twist your wires and wrap some tape. Actually take the time, you know, and solder them up, make, make them right. So I'm gonna put a new fuse in it and plug it in with this stuff not connecting just to test and see if it powers up. And if it does, then we'll be able to go ahead and move on to, you know, fixing that. And then I can show you how to fix an antenna mast. Yay. Well, it's copyrighted music, so I have it turned down. Um, initially powered it up, nothing was happening. And then I wiggled a bunch of stuff and it powered up. So, and we do have our front speakers and door speakers working. So that's promising. We just need to go through and actually like properly fix that wire and then see if it tries to even run that uh, power antenna. Uh, but, but, you know. Here, wait, let's, can you, can you, see? no, you can't. You just see the phone. Um, pretend, pretend that's my face. No, that's dumb. At any rate, <laughs> radio is working for a couple cent fuse. We are working uh, forward in a good way on a budget. And there we go. That looks 
I don't know. I feel like that looks a lot better. I got some of the wire care two to one shrink ratio. Also, if you guys are looking for wiring stuff, I really can't recommend the wire care team enough. They've got just about everything you could possibly want. It's incredibly high quality and it's affordable. You can spend a little bit less, but especially with wiring products, there is a big difference between spending a little bit more. The tools are better, everything's a lot nicer. I use my Pressmaster crimper and stripper from them. Worked amazing, absolutely loved it. So always in the description box is a link to wire care. I'm excited to be a part of their family and kind of get to use their products because I do a lot of wiring on camera and off camera and it lets me, you know, turn that electrical tape mess into something that's kind of nice. I could take a little bit more time with it, but that is a really old Pioneer radio. It is so old, in fact, that it only has one output. So the truck can take an output for the amplifier if it had an amplifier and the antenna, but we only have one of those switches out there. So that means if you're playing a CD, the antenna will be up, but that's okay. So we'll plug this in, see if it's gonna try to run our antenna up and down. And once we know it does that, then I'll show you how to uh, replace Toyota antenna mast and save hundreds of dollars. All right, so with your power uh, antenna, your motor lives inside the fender and you have your mast that's extended and exposed here. And the way you start is this is a winged nut here that looks like it's got Bondo or something in it. It's really weird whatever they've done. Um, I guess they were trying to stop it from going up and down. There's special sockets or you can take a pair of needle nose and catch into those grooves at the top so you don't damage the chrome. Another thing you can do to tape, tape it up to also help protect it. One thing we're fighting is it's already kind of damaged and... Again, someone got in here and was a little aggressive when they didn't have to be. Why is nothing on this thing? I guess it's coming back to haunt me. Nothing is working easy, and that's because it started up so well, right? Just a little simple security bypass to get us going. and It's loose, getting some turning. It's a really neat design with these masts is they're driven by a plastic kind of toothed rod on the inside of this and your motor just runs up and down with a gear engaging it. But after time, that plastic can get brittle and break. And that's what the cause of most of these problems are is the plastic breaks. And um, some people will just pull the rest of this out and feed a new plastic mast in. The problem with that is there's only so much room for everything to fit down below. Wow, why? It's JB welded. I, I have seen a lot. I've never seen that one. This is fully broken. And here's that plastic, some of that plastic. And as you can see, it's broken and not very happy. And if we just immediately move on to trying to feed in the new parts, there's a whole lot more of that plastic down below. Let me open up the new mast so you can kind of see. All of this is in that motor. So if you just shoved it all together, it would jam up and not work well. So our next step is to come in and actually pull the motor loose and open it up to pull that plastic. So let me reposition you so you can follow along. Nice. Don't you love it when there's an ant infestation? They're all over the ground and they're just like raining out of there. So um, before I start shoving my hand in there too much more, um, I'm going to deal with that so I can then show you removing the wing nut and getting everything going. I was a little bit worried half a second because uh, when I first powered up and this should have been running, it wasn't. And I just went ahead and popped it apart and saw they went through the trouble of unplugging it. But again, it's, it's not hard to do these antenna masts. So hopefully we'll get all of you guys with operational antennas as soon as the ants go away. Welcome 
to the inner fender, former ant's nest. So this is our antenna here, and they're just held in by one 10 mil, generally, at least on a Toyota. Take that loose, and since we have that upper nut, this thing will start to walk out a little bit for us. Now, the antenna cable, the part that goes into the radio, that's one solid cable. Some of these motors will have a disconnect. Most of the, at least on a Toyota, doesn't. So that's where you've got to kind of work in the fender well. You're not able to pull it out into the open and have a ton of room. But we're gonna make it work anyway. So we get her loose, slide it down. And again, here you go. You see the antenna cable. This goes all the way in. It, it, it's deceiving. It looks like it could disconnect here. And again, some do, this one doesn't. So all we need to do is pull up the all-weather sheath. There we go. So we need to open up this case here, which screw, 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 not that screw, this screw, this screw, and then that screw, and it has a nut on the back side. Now this is a job, it's a little bit easier on the reassembly side if you have a second set of hands. I don't, so we're gonna make it work. Let me just lift your door up here. It's got some dum dum sealant. If you want, you can add a little bit more grease in all of the masts I've done. Look at all this plastic that's still in there. So you can see that there wouldn't be much room for it. But the way it works is that mast comes in here goes through this small channel and then gets fed into this toothed wheel. I have never seen one of these go bad, not to say it can't happen, but make sure that's all good. Everything's happy there. Drop that back in, set that back on, screws back in, and we're gonna be able to feed that new mast in. I know, you, you get to look at a wire right now, it's real exciting. I'm trying. There's only so much room. All the times I've done this job too, never thought I'd be making a video about doing it. Our dealer would charge anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half to change this out. So they will make a lot of money doing it, because as you can see, it's not too terribly hard once you get the path figured out. Come on. Never had one quite this much. Guessing it's because it's got a camera on it. And then grinding strap. Perfect. Slide our cover back down. knock you guys around a little bit. Now, you're not gonna put the nut in just yet on top, and that's because we have to feed the new antenna in. Secure up your wire. Also, snug this down, or you know, like get it close to tight, but don't bottom it out just yet. And that is because I like to go ahead and get the top nut fully in and then lock it down because there's a little bit of wiggle room between these two. They got to work together. Perfect. All right, back to the outside. So what I like to do is go ahead and kind of pre-feed this down a little bit so you feel it stop. And then this is where it's tricky. You've got to turn the radio on and then I like to push and you'll hear the gears kind of like grinding as you know, it's skipping. And then you turn it off so it goes to retract the antenna. And while it's retracting, you feed it in until it goes all the way down. So. All right, so here. stuck a little bit, dang it. All right, so on and off real quick. Yep, yep, the other way. 
Yeah, the antenna's installed. I put the motor together and took it apart, and I found the tiniest piece of plastic that was jamming the gearbox up from the pinion of the motor. And I ran it and ran it and ran it, and we're finally radio on. And she's up, and then radio off. Hey, I don't know how many of these I have done, but man, what a pain in the butt that was. Like I, it's, it really is normally a very simple thing. Take it apart, clean all the plastic. Somehow this little piece of plastic got under or it didn't belong and it just, it was binding everything up. Good news is that is working. Radio's back together. She comes on and off. It is not a Bluetooth radio which is a little bit of a bummer. You have an auxiliary in in the front and you have radio and a CD. I contemplated going ahead and changing it out. I've got a double din that would take this whole space up, but that's a very expensive radio. And we're trying to keep this thing kind of, again, cheap on a budget, it's a flip. So if I was keeping it for myself, I would be upgrading the radio. Radio works, they can tune in, they can plug their phone in, there, there's ways for them to play the music they want. So it's the stop. Don't spend more than you have to. And a nice radio would be cool, but we don't need it to sell it. We just need it to turn on so everything is able to work. So that's where we're at with it. Hopefully I got a few more parts in so we can do some more of the mechanical work and get it back on the ground and driving. But for now, I guess it's, a, it's the afternoon. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? Actually, it's 512 here. So it's, it's five o'clock here. We'll see you hopefully with parts tomorrow. All right, you're just gonna see hands. I'm not gonna put gloves on, that's Chris Fix's thing. If you remember when we tried to start the Forerunner a couple times, we were getting a hard click. <sighs> well, time for new GoPro batteries. You're getting one angle of this. But I made a comment how it was a starter contact that was failing and these are your starter contact parts. So this is the part where power comes through, it attracts this plunger down, and it transfers power to actually spin the starter. It's super, super common on these Toyotas, and what's funny is you can tell it's been a problem because they just started being banging the heck out of it. Ordering this plunger kit on Amazon was a whopping $12, and it comes with so much more than I used to get at the dealership for rebuilding. It's new plastic caps for the outside, an entire new plunger, we've got new bolts, We've got just everything. So let me go ahead and pop this cap off so we can see how shot the plunger is in here. These plunger and contacts are probably gonna have a lot of pits on them, kind of look like a small crater everywhere. Just overall worn out. I did so many of these things. Now it's super common with these Denso starters that they wear out and need contacts before everything else fails. If you've got one of these, you can fix it generally for about 12 bucks and a little bit of time. Now, if you've got one of the V8s from Toyota that has the starter under the intake manifold that takes a fair bit more effort to get, those frequently would just get an entire new, you know, outside remanufactured starter. I would do contacts personally, but 
you don't have to, you can replace them all. But if you look in there, you can see these high points and burn marks in it. And those are spots where if it caught in between there, it couldn't make proper contact and wouldn't transfer the power. If you look in here, you can see there's a huge lip. Let me actually pop that out because you'll see it a lot easier that way. Also, these bolts do not take a ton of torque. Looks like someone maybe was in here once before and they got a little eager tightening all this down. Here we go. So if you look, if I line it upright, you see how incredibly sharp that edge is, how worn down this piece of metal is compared to the new one. You know, nice and flat, probably cut something with this. So if you've got one of these cars, it is super easy to do these contacts. Generally the hardest thing is getting your starter out of the vehicle, but if you're putting a new one in, you're, you know, pulling the starter anyway. Now, if you were only doing contacts and not the plunger, you can resurface these once or twice. You need to make sure it's perfectly flat and then sand it with a file or something, fine grit. But again, for the price that this kit was to include uh, a new plunger, it was like, yeah, no, I'll just click buy now. Let's get it coming. And then you don't have to bang on your starter anymore. That doesn't always work on these modern modern deals. It's an old problem. Whew, that's a crunchy O-ring too. You do want to inspect your plastic insulators because, you know, that's a lot of voltage. This comes with the new one. Well, I won't say voltage, amperage. It becomes a dead short <laughs> if these aren't uh, properly insulated from the starter case. So you don't want that. You're going to have a bad time. Now, one reason why we're kind of jumping around, so I got one box of parts in from uh, Rock Auto and it was the wiper blades and like little things we don't need yet. So um, I'm still waiting for a lot of parts. Unfortunately, FedEx was the shipper. Yeah, FedEx has just been absolutely terrible. I don't know what's happened to you guys. It used to be my go-to when something had to get somewhere. Lately, for my home deliveries, They've more or less just been throwing them in the street. Uh, one, one was marked that I had a gate blocking entrance, um, which we don't have a gate or fence, and the picture uh, even showed it, and they just kind of dropped it off in the street. The last FedEx shipment that actually showed up to my house, they said they left it in the mail room, and by mail room, they meant leaning up against my mailbox. Apparently that qualifies as a mail room now. So, I don't know. Everyone has shipping horror stories. It just seems like no shipping company is what they used to be. Just kind of a bummer. Drop that down. Again, small amount of torque. It's too cold for you, fly. Go away. Should have done like a speed run on this. I normally can do these really quick. You slow down and try to talk about it. It takes a little more time, but it's still not bad. Also, hopefully the audio gets better. I'm sorry about the last couple videos. Uh, I got some new stuff and, you know, I'm a mechanic first. We're learning this videoing thing. It was just some of the settings. I had one to come in as quiet as possible, but it wasn't enough. So hopefully we don't blow out any more eardrums, no more peaking audio. Hopefully, we'll see. Yeah, no, we're almost out of battery. Okay, so now that that's back in place, test fit your new plunger. Make sure she'll drop down, which she does, and make good contact. So boom, there you go. Now it's just change out your gasket on the cap, put it back in the vehicle, and uh, you didn't have to buy a new starter. All right, cap is on, and we have ourselves a good starter.
has been a couple days since I have actually, you know, held the camera and got you uh, updated with everything we were doing. I've had time lapses going. Uh, for a lot of it, I actually did a couple just quick pickups on the cell phone to just take you along. I apologize. Uh, I've been feeling pretty sick. We're still far from 100% if you can't see it in the eyes and just general voice isn't there. But I have to get this thing done to the next level. So the video goes out on time, which it's going to be late, but we're going to have it out this week because um, it, it's technically due in a, a 24 hours is when I'd like to post it. And I haven't sent Dwayne any footage. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> we're making progress on the Forerunner, but it has fought us a lot. We've gone over some of the unexpected, like that right front wheel bearing where uh, I'll just walk you around and get you get you there. So the right front wheel bearing after pricing out all the components, I was able to get an entire new spindle or knuckle for $55. So we now have this fully together with our new pad slapped in. We've got our lifting blocks pulled out of there, the leveling blocks that made it very unlevel, a new lower bolt because that was broken. Excuse that, I've been uh, burping coolant and working on the top side. And as we get here, if you notice, that's shiny and new. And that's because I missed something on my initial walk around and I've already turned in the caliper as a core. So I missed a wheel bearing. We missed caliper damage. Always plan for unexpected when you're doing these things. What's kind of bumped me into a problem is all of my expected were out of cosmetics money. And I told you guys a good running car that looks eh, will never sell as quickly or easily or as much as a good looking car that just is kind of eh, mechanical. But personally, I don't feel good selling something that I don't know has solid bones underneath it. It needs to be right mechanically and I will take less money on the flip so that way I feel good selling it. You guys make those decisions. Um, but this was a safety problem, what had happened is this part of the caliper was broken and it allowed that pin to flop and as that pin could flop it was bending pins binding pads and it just it wasn't right 83 dollars later we got ourselves a new caliper it's what had to be done i got those wires nice and fixed up there that's all done up we'll show you the top stuff when we get there. This was a nightmare to clean. There was so much axle grease and just disgusting in there. It took a lot, but we've got it clean. We've got all of our new seals in there. This is ready to go. I'm just waiting for the phone call that the drums are done being turned at, uh, took them to O'Reilly's and they're able to turn them for less than a third the cost of a new drum. You don't need to just automatically replace it. We did the video before where you can turn rotors, you can turn drums, and it saves a tremendous amount of money. $30 versus $100. There's service life built into these parts. You don't just have to replace them. You can machine them a couple times, and we've got that going on. So as soon as I get them back, I'll be able to get the rear brakes on, bleed brakes, set the thing on the ground. I'm excited. That should hopefully be later today. What I really like on the Toyota drums is their self adjusters, their auto adjusters. The way brake shoes work, they actually can apply more clamp force and do better than disc brakes. They just get really hot because everything's contained. You have your uh, wheel cylinder and it pushes out and as it pushes out both of the shoes, they actually kind of bind and lock in that drum. And as they rotate, they kind of pivot down here and that whole pivoting mechanism pushes them out even more into the drum. So it's just that it's a really good system. But what I like is the auto adjuster. So they don't work really well if you don't have them close to the drum, but on the Toyotas, their parking brake auto adjuster is really great. So when you apply your parking brake, it pulls this arm here. And as it pulls this arm, you can see it's pushing out that shoe, but your auto adjuster goes up. So boom, it's already pulled it out a little bit. So if you have a Toyota with drums, use your parking brake. It's gonna keep them in adjustment. Pulls up, turns it out. So it just, it's a really, really good system. It keeps these things in good adjustment. We've got our rear end filled with some fresh Valvoline gear lube. We got a new seal in it. Also, when you're working on these, if you ever run into a problem 
where you've got a uh, wheel seal blowing out. Also pop your breather, make sure that's not blocked up, that air is passing through, because you can sometimes get these to clog up, especially on an off-roader, and uh, if that happens, you'll blow your seals out that way. And under here, let's kneel down, we got a new transmission mount going on there, and I have all new U-joints front and rear, and uh, that should actually, the new U-joints, that one was completely bound up. When it was apart, like, I could not rotate it. It was a destroyed joint, and uh, between that and that transmission mount, pretty sure should roll out a little bit smoother. Let me uh, lower the car and we'll be in the engine bay. Hey, welcome to the engine bay. And uh, yeah, it kind of looks like it did before, right? Except we've taken all of this apart. We've got the new valve covers heavily cleaned and uh, looking good, hidden underneath. All new rubber washers. So if you're ever doing one of these Toyotas or any company that has those rubber washers, you need to replace them. They are what keep the torque of your gasket. Um, and it, it accounts for the little bit of change as rubber gets hard. It, it's gonna keep them from leaking longer. We got our new master cylinder reservoir and uh, filled with some Valvoline brake fluid. We're just waiting for drums so I can bleed those out. We've got our coolant in now because before we put just water, knowing we were gonna take apart, take a look at that thermostat. It was an aftermarket thermostat that was actually binding on itself, so it now has a Toyota thermostat with the uh, breather. There's a little jiggle valve, and these, for whatever reason, are happier with it pointed down. Normally, you always put the jiggle valve, you know, 12 o'clock, top of the motor. In my experience, and I've actually saw some of you commenting the same thing. The valve down on these uh, three fours, and they're happier. Air boot. We cleaned up, I went and got a new heater core hose, so that really kind of ugly, weird thing was gone. I also discovered one of the bolts, when we were taking apart, a bolt was missing, and that's because it was broken off down below. Bolt's gone, it's all good. A really silly thing, I re-ran all the spark plug wires and paired them up correctly so they point in the right direction on this side and just made it look nicer. It's completely filthy. It's not been, you know, like clean, cleaned yet, but mechanically, we're getting it right. So I'm gonna hopefully run and pick up those brake drums. We're gonna get this thing mechanically wrapped up here in just a little bit. So we can go ahead and end the episode on a, I feel a pretty big win. We're down to uh, getting that glass installed, detailing it and selling it. So uh, queue up, we're just gonna like jump ahead, brakes on, wheels on, and uh, we're gonna be Done. I'm a little ready. Well, we got our drums. That's the good news. Uh, we kind of ran into more problems. We're gonna keep things real rather than me just trying to cover something up that we race through. This is the reality of trying to flip some cars. You sometimes have problems and I'm out of time to get footage to editor Dwayne, so. We're, we're ending with it on the lift, and the next episode is going to be a little bit delayed because we need to get the last piece of mechanical. We are going to cosmetically transform, and it's going to include the sale. So however long it takes to sell the truck is kind of the delay there. But let me, again, let's just walk around and see the good parts. First off, friends at O'Reilly did a great job cutting these drums, giving us the best possible finish we can out of them. So we have round, true, clean metal for our shoes. And again, those adjusters I showed you, the automatic adjusters, I love it. You get it close, you go inside, and you just set the parking brake, make your shop quiet, and you can hear it click. And when it stops clicking, it's adjusted itself out just right. You get the slight drag that the Toyota's like, and it's perfect, there's no guessing. You have the little adjuster, you just keep pulling, and it sets your drums up perfect, which I love, it's just, easy. So that's, that's good news. We have our brake fluid coming down to our brand new caliper, doing everything it should. Um, and that's where we found the problem is when I started to bleed our calipers. So I want you to take real close. Maybe Dwayne will do kind of a cool side by side of this shot. And uh, do you notice anything wrong? And I really should have seen it sooner but I didn't 
And had I seen it sooner, I would only be buying one caliper, but I'm buying two. So anytime you have a brake caliper, your disc brake bleeder is supposed to be on top because air bubbles up. <sighs> they had two left side calipers on this truck. <laughs> I, I didn't think to look because, you know, you, you don't always hunt for things like that. And it's frustrating because we were already, already kind of out of our $2,000 budget. So we're going to have to tally it all up. I think, I think we're going to end up $300 over. I technically haven't put the windshield in, so we could scratch that. But that safety, it needs to get done. And it, we're still going to be a little bit over. So, oh, man. Which, it's just it's one of those things. I mean, you, you have to have a good attitude about it. We are still well ahead. It's just unfortunate that we can't make it look super, super nice because then we could maybe ask a little bit more, but I'm trying to stick true to the $2,000 budget as much as possible short of the absolute have tos like the right side caliper. And had I noticed it earlier, I would have just took this left side caliper, put it on the left side and bought a right side. But now we'll, we'll just, we'll have two brand new calipers. Whoever's buying it, the brakes are gonna be good. I mean, we're, we've gone through a whole lot on this truck. It's gonna run and drive great. I really wanted to be doing that right now. But like I was saying earlier, our third episode is gonna be the cosmetic restoration where we have zero dollars to do it. So we'll see how good we can get it looking. We'll get it going down the road after getting the caliper on it. Um, but yeah, I've gotta wait for some tag paperwork to come back on the state side uh, rather than just you know holding and flipping a title. I'm gonna pay my sales taxes like you're supposed to. We're not including that in the budget because your state may be different and you may want to just float a title. You shouldn't if your state doesn't allow it. And we will list it for sale. Maybe one of you guys will want to buy it. Let me know. Um, it is two-wheel two -wheel drive, pre-runner, two-wheel drive. I had one person real excited to get it. And unfortunately for Philip, it's two-wheel drive, not four-wheel drive and won't be a good hunting buggy. But we're still winning. We, we are so far ahead. The truck runs great. It couldn't they claimed it didn't run before. We've got it completely resealed. We've got our starter rebuilt. We've got trans mounts in it. We've got the drive shaft fixed. We've got wheel bearings fixed. We've got fresh brakes all around. We got front wheel bearing fixed. Like it's, we're winning. Hopefully you are learning to uh, look a little bit closer. I'm not gonna say it was the camera's fault, uh, but no, I, I just, I screwed up. I <laughs> should have looked a little bit closer. We've got ourselves a running, soon to be driving again, Forerunner, and we are gonna be in it less than $2,300. So we're doing good. And again, bottom market price for that seems to be about 4,000. So we're still in a really good spot. So I hope this encourages you guys, find yourself a project, whether you wanna fix it up for you to drive and have your own cool car, or you wanna try to flip a little bit of money on uh, your free time and get you know, trade up, take, turn a forerunner into a Supra. Hopefully we can do that, but that's it. Dwayne needs this footage. He's got to try to get this edited for you. Sorry, Dwayne, that it's, that it's late. <sighs> Good luck. Anyway, I appreciate you guys as always hanging out with us in the shop while we uh, work on some uh, questionable cars, but we're going to make them right. But I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and questionable doesn't mean stupid. Those are two different things. So put your brake bleeders on uh, the right side so you can actually bleed the brakes. Don't, don't do with whatever that guy did. See ya.